Car tester Michelle Assenmacher is in Britain to test Minnie's new countryman. She's going to try it out off-road. The second generation of this subcompact crossover was introduced in the fall of 2016. It's available with the full range of engines and the new all-wheel drive system, all four an electro-hydraulic differential that redirects power to the back wheels when the front wheels lose traction in extreme conditions. The all-wheel powertrain is connected to the dynamic stability control, which tells it the optimum distribution of power between the front and rear axles. That helps keep the new Mini on track, even in the slippier conditions. Michelle's taken the Mini Countryman across a highly demanding stretch with deep mud holes and came out in one piece. Now she'll take a clean car and test it on the regular roads. In the Mini's home, people drive on the left, another challenge for Michelle. She keeps a little reminder in plain sight on the rear view mirror. This version puts out 141 kilowatts of power and accelerates to 100 kilometers per hour in just 7.3 seconds. Mini rates average fuel consumption at 7.1 liters per 100 kilometers. Prices start at 31,900 euros in Germany. The new Countryman offers a choice of four engines, two gasoline powered and two diesels, with a plug-in hybrid coming in June 2017. Michelle boasts that she's taken down the keep left reminder because thanks to the Mini Countryman's good all-round visibility, she feels quite at home in England's traffic. The first generation Mini Countryman sold nearly 550,000 units, a solid base for the second to build on. It offers a number of new features besides. The new Mini Countryman is no longer so mini. It's added 20 centimeters in length and three in width, extending its wheelbase by seven and a half centimeters and making for a roomier interior. The cockpit has a new touch display equipped with the Mini Connected Infotainment System. The front seats can be adjusted electrically. The rear seats easily and quickly transform into a lounge for two people. The trunk holds 450 liters, expanding to 1,390 with the rear seats folded down. Michelle says the Mini Countryman's interior is playful and finds that she can adjust and set things to her heart's content over the new touch display. She especially likes the switches on the center console, saying they feel great and seem well made. The only thing she doesn't like is the gas gauge. It seems a bit yesterday. The more spacious Countryman can now serve as a family first car. It handles well both off-road and on city streets. And it has a little something extra. Finally, Michelle points out that if you want to take in the air a bit after a long working day, you can roll out the Mini Countryman's picnic bench to sit comfortably in back and commune with nature. Mitsubishi has given the Lancer a makeover. Among the features are a front-end facelift, new rims, and an updated interior. It's available in sedan or sportback models. We tested the sportback. 
The new front has a wide front bumper painted in the same color of the car and a horizontal radiator grille with chrome. What's more, there are new headlights with LED daytime running lights on the sides. This feature, however, is standard only in the plus and top equipment packages. A look at the Lancer Sport back from the side reveals a flaw that's remained in the revamped model. Car test Emanuel Schaefer says the car still has blind spots. Just like before its facelift, the Lancer had very wide C-pillars. A small rear window and the back seat headrests are difficult to lower. This makes it difficult for the driver to see what's behind the car. Thank goodness, a reverse assist camera is available as an option. Yet, if you want this driving aid, you've got to choose the plus package or higher. Imanuel says Mitsubishi has taken some of the criticism of its customers to heart because whereas the previous model had only 270 cubic liters of trunk space, the new Lancer can fit far more cargo with 400. The interior still has clean lines, says Emanuel, with only a few climate control knobs. A touchscreen does the rest, but it's a shame. Even the more expensive models still don't come with a sat-nav. Emanuel says the car is comfortable, but he finds that the sides of the seats are far too soft. So when the car is cornering, you're sort of thrown off balance. He advises making the sides of the seats firmer or redesigning the seating. The engines are known quantities. They both run on gasoline and produce 86 and 103 kilowatts of power respectively. We're testing the smaller 1.6 liter model. It can take the Lancer Sport back from zero to 110.7 seconds. With a maximum speed of 191 kilometers per hour, the manufacturer says it uses 5.5 liters of fuel to travel 100 kilometers. Emmanuel says the Lancer Sportback comes with either a 1.8-liter gasoline engine with a CVT automatic or, what we're driving, a 1.6-liter five-speed manual. He says the five-speed is outdated. Most cars in this range already have six-speed transmissions. It remains to be seen whether the face-lifted Lancer will be carried on for another generation because Mitsubishi is already planning a mid-size sedan for its Renault-Nissan alliance. Industry analysts say this model could follow the Lancer, perhaps under a new name as well. Audi presents the Q8 concept car, a plug-in hybrid. A 3-liter turbocharged fuel stratified injection engine teams up with an electric motor to generate 330 kilowatts and 700 newton meters of torque. The Q8 is based on the new Q7's platform. Audi says the Q8 burns 2.3 liters per 100 kilometers. The concept car is the basis for a model slated to roll off the assembly lines in 2018. Porsche presents its Panamera 4e Hybrid in the executive version with a wheelbase widened by 15 centimeters. This chauffeur sedan with hybrid gasoline electric powertrain gets 340 kilowatts and accelerates like a 911 turbo. It has 700 newton meters of torque from the start. Thanks to a boost function, it reaches 100 kilometers an hour in just 4.6 seconds. Ever since Lexus first rolled out the IS, it's been one of the Toyota Luxury Division's premier models. More than a million in three generations have been sold globally in 17 years. This Lexus was developed especially for the European market, and now it's been given a makeover. 
Current test to Enos Petri says the IS's facelift only changed a few small details, a touch or two on the exterior, a new concept for the switches, and a new safety package. Also new is the suspension. It gives the driver more direct contact with the road and makes driving a bit more fun. We tested the hybrid model, the 300H. It currently accounts for a good 90% of all IS sales. Whether hybrid or turbo gasoline variants, the facelift hasn't affected the powertrain. But enhanced aerodynamics have reduced average fuel consumption by a marginal tenth of a liter per hundred kilometers. The axles, shocks, and chassis have been retuned for a stiffer suspension. This is the principal difference to its predecessor. This, together with new software for the variable gear ratio steering, adds up to more responsive steering. The F-Sport variant we tested also features adaptive suspension. Enos recalls that the suspension and the road feedback had always been subject to criticism, so it was a good decision for the engineers to start there. Now she's glad to be testing the sports variant with the sport suspension, and she can't find anything about the road feedback or the steering to complain about. It responds to her very directly and leaves her with a positive impression. On the outside, only a few details have been changed. The spindle-shaped grille's waistline has shifted upwards and the visual focal point moved downwards. The air intakes and running lights are new and a little removed from the headlights. The head and tail light technology is entirely in LEDs now. Enos explains that the car's Japanese soul is expressed in tiny details and described by the term takumi, which means high craftsmanship. She points out the leather dashboard over the instrument cluster with decorative stitching and the wooden applications worked with a special kind of laser technology. Lexus IS also has a new 10.3-inch display, and the adaptive suspension brought with it an additional mode allowing the driver to set the car's character according to personal preferences. Enos recognizes the little joystick from the last version of the vehicle, but the two enter buttons left and right are new. They send off whatever the operator enters. The idea is to make it more intuitive and easier to operate. Enos has a positive overall impression of the facelift on every point. She thought the design of the front had always been fairly offbeat, and now it's even more so. The concept for the controls has simplified them, a noticeable improvement, and the suspension makes driving more fun. So all in all, she'd call it a success. In Germany, the new Lexus IS 300H starts at about 38,500 euros. Car tester Sasha Knopp reminds us that competition in the luxury class is very tough. Even major manufacturers like Audi and BMW have a hard time up against the leader of the pack, the Mercedes S-Class. And so it's hardly surprising when some of them tinker with their positioning. For example, Maserati with the Quattro Port, or Porsche with the Panamera. And now that's what Jaguar is doing with the XJ. While older Jaguars maintain the British tradition of understatement, the new XJ is much sportier than its predecessors. Jaguar describes this model as its most daring interpretation to date. The XJ came out with a facelift in 2016. This version offers LED headlights and rear lights. The power steering is now electromechanical.
Inside, this big cat simply purrs with luxury. Quilted leather seats are reminiscent of Baroque design. The Meridian sound system with up to 1,300 watts pampers passengers in the portfolio variant. A 12.3-inch HD display serves as instrument panel. The 8-inch display in the middle console can operate by touch. As with modern smartphones, it recognizes the swipe. The trunk has 520 liters of storage space. Sasha says that the right-hand back seat may be the most comfortable spot in the Mercedes S-Class, but in the Jaguar XJ, the driver's seat is best. Leg room in the back seat is adequate, but the headroom isn't so great. Still, there is plenty of comfort and luxury, with seat heating that can also cool and four-zone air conditioning as well. Another comfort feature is the non-linear steering. The wheels not only turn more, the more you turn the steering wheel, the rate at which they turn increases. That's especially convenient when you want to park or shunt. This feature may not please everyone, but Sasha likes it. Our test car with the portfolio package costs just under 93,000 euros in Germany. Jaguar says combined fuel consumption is 5.7 liters per 100 kilometers. Two engines are available with the portfolio package, this diesel and a three liter gasoline engine. Sasha is testing the 3-liter diesel. It puts out 221 kilowatts or 300 horsepower and 700 newton meters of torque. That's quite a bit. Sasha likes that the tried-and-true ZF 8-speed automatic transmission transmits power to the rear axle almost silently. The Jaguar XJ glides over the blacktop with effortless elegance. Sasha says top-notch acoustic insulation makes the car's comfort perfect. Even the sound of the horn hardly reaches the interior. An app enables the owner to carry out many functions via smartphone. For example, he receives an immediate warning if the car is broken into or stolen. The car can also be located with an app. Plus, you can preheat the interior or check your fuel gauge with a smartphone. All-wheel drive is available only in combination with the gasoline engine. The diesel engine comes only with rear-wheel drive. A 5-liter V8 compressor comes in the XJR model, which costs about 50,000 euros more than the XJ version we're testing. It produces 405 kilowatts. Sasha regrets that his luxurious drive must come to an end. When parking, remember that the Jaguar XJ is a large car, and visibility around it isn't as good as might be desired. But that's why it comes with a 360-degree panoramic camera. If you rely on the rearview mirror, remember that the rear window is extremely sloped, which means you can't really see the rear end of the car from inside. But Sasha says he had a lot of fun driving the Jaguar XJ with the 3-liter diesel engine, and that the driver's seat is definitely the best place in this sedan. The legendary Alfa Romeo logo. Back in 1971, it graced the radiator grille of a front-wheel drive compact for the first time, the Alfa Zud. The Italian automaker hoped the car would help it attract new customers, and they wanted to stimulate the local economy too as our classy car expert Christoph Bauer explains.
Austrian car designer Rudolf Hruska was given the mammoth task of creating the car. He'd previously worked under Ferdinand Porsche on the VW Beetle and had helped develop the Giulietta for Alfa Romeo in the early 1950s. Ruska made plans not only for the car, but also for a new factory in Pomigliano d'Arco near Naples. And he quickly dubbed the car the Alfa Zud, the Alfa of the South. Rudolf Ruska was well connected and assembled a team of former Fiat engineers. Starting from scratch, they designed a compact car that was very progressive for its time. It boasted plenty of space and aerodynamic shape and sporty performance. There was just one problem. Rust. Christoph says it quickly ruined the Alpha Zood's reputation. By the time the first vehicle inspections rolled around, some parts had completely rusted through, and a few Alpha Zoods were completely unsalvageable after just four years. That's because staff at the Alpha plant spent almost as much time on strike as they did working, so body shells sometimes spent weeks sitting around in the salty sea air, and rust set in even before they were painted. The company's quick fix of filling the vehicle's hollow cavities with synthetic foam just made things worse. It soaked up water like a sponge, producing more rust. That was a shame because otherwise the Alpha Sud is a well-engineered car. Christoph explains that it was the first Alfa Romeo to use front-wheel drive. While safer than traditional rear-wheel drive, it can make for dull driving, but not in the Alfa Zud. It's fun and great on curves, thanks to Rudolf Ruska and his great suspension with McPherson struts at the front and a pressed steel rear axle. Unusual for a front-wheel drive model, it tends to oversteer due to the negative camber at the front normally only seen in race cars. Except for a hatchback, the Alpha suit had all the ingredients which would three years later make the Volkswagen Golf such a success. Christoph says the Alpha suit's design was decades ahead of its time. The short overhangs allow for a long wheelbase, and combined with the steep fastback makes for heaps of room inside. And that was head designer Rudolf Ruska's intention. He was also two meters tall and wanted to build an Italian car that could seat four Central Europeans comfortably. The body was styled by none other than Giorgetto Giugiaro, designer of the first VW Golf. The Alpha Zood shape is very aerodynamic. A compact boxer engine allows for a flat hood and a low center of gravity. The sloping rear also optimizes airflow and improves handling. Inside, the car exudes a sporty kind of purism. Plastic and rubber are used to create a clearly arranged and ergonomic cockpit. The lack of creature comforts allowed Alfa Romeo to sell the car for an unbeatable price equivalent to around 4,000 euros. Christoph is also impressed by the compact boxer engine with 1.2 or later up to 1.5 liters of cubic capacity. From the start, they left enough room to increase capacity. The first Alfa Zud from 1971 eked 63 horsepower out of 1.2 liters of cubic capacity. The car Christoph is driving is a 1.3 liter engine with an output of 68 horsepower. He says in 1972, German trade magazine Auto, Motor and Sport praised the car's incredibly quiet engine, which produced little vibration even at high revs. Yet the 1.3 liter boxer engine is very agile, and you can even rev it up to 7,000 RPM for short periods. It's a real Alpha. So the little Alfa was able to live up to the great expectations buyers had of an Alfa Romeo. Soon the car maker expanded the Alfa Zud range to include the Giardinetta station wagon and the Sprint Sports Coupe. Although over one million of these cars were produced, few have survived. 
Christoph finds it tragic that people today only associate the Alfa Sud with rust because this car was arguably the most progressive of its time. Created in the 1960s, it was still state-of-the-art in the 90s. Its design anticipated the shapes of many compact sedans built years later. So rust or not, Christoph says the Alfa Sud was a stroke of genius and a milestone in automotive history. At the time, competitors accused Alfa Romeo of selling the car at dumping prices. The Alfa Sud's Spartan interior, coupled with its progressive technology, added up to great driving pleasure at an affordable price.